Welcome back to Network Steganography. We are at chapter 3, where I will introduce some fundamental countermeasures. So, um, the countermeasures against covert channels that I introduce in this chapter are quite heterogeneous. Um, and in contrast to a later chapter, where I will introduce countermeasures specific for network steganography. Um, these countermeasures can also be applied um, to, um, for instance, prevent or limit local covert channels between um, processes. An additional read for those interested However, in German, is my book Tunnel and Verdeckte Kanäle im Netz. Um, there is one chapter on countermeasures, and um, so it's it's not relevant for the exam. Uh, I will I describe all the countermeasures that I described in this chapter in this book chapter, uh, but also uh, some additional ones. So if you want to deepen your knowledge, refer to that book or to chapter to the last chapter of the book Information Hiding and Communication networks. When I say not relevant for the exam, I only mean this book. This chapter, number three, is of course relevant for the exam. Okay, so we start with an early approach from the 1980s. Actually, this is the earliest approach that I'm aware of, and it's the Shared Resource Metrics Methodology, or in short, SRM methodology. It's a general approach to detect covert storage channels. And it can be applied to different steps of the uh, STL, where STL is the software development lifecycle. Um, with this approach or methodology, we can detect covert channels within textual specifications of the software, but also in source code. The core idea, um, the core SRM comes from camera, Richard Camera, and later it was improved by John McHugh. Uh, we will first focus on the original version. And a general assumption is that the system can be described by operations and attributes. So the goal of the SRM is to determine whether an operation X can modify an attribute under uh, A under the condition that the operation Y uh, can read the attribute A. So in other words, we have two operations that operate on the same attribute, but one writes it or modifies it and the other recognizes the modification with a read operation. Um, so um, if you have a specification of a software and you want processes not to uh, create a covert channel over um, shared attributes used by different operations, then you can check the SRM metrics, which we can see here. Or First, of course, you need to build the metrics and then you can check. So for every um, operation in your program, let's assume you have um, the operation read, write, delete and create, and they operate on files in the file system. So you can read files, write two files, delete a file or create a new one. And you have different attributes for these operations. For instance, existence of a file, file owner, file name, file size. So uh, let's assume you read a file. Then, of course, you infer, you, you receive some information about the existence of a file. You cannot read a file that doesn't exist. When you write a file, you also know uh, whether the file exists or not, at least in this version of um, the SRM. When you delete a file, you ca can either modify the file existence because you remove the file or you read it. Um, both is feasible. Same with creation. You read and modify file existence. You either create the file or you read um, the existence of the file because you you know that you cannot, uh, you, you experience that you cannot create a file again because it already exists. So you, you read about the file existence. Um, then um, you uh, have a file owner which you can read and delete, uh, read and modify using delete and create and so on. 
Now, the question is, can you establish a covert channel here? And the, to answer this question, you need to check whether some operation can modify an attribute that another can read. And of course, this is feasible. For instance, using the attribute existence of the file. So you could use delete and create. If one, oper if one process would create a file, uh, let's assume it's a high-level process, then the other process, the receiving low-level process, could try to delete the file and by that it learns whether the file of course exists or not and it does not have the permission eventually to delete the file, so it can infer the information um, and sent by the high-level process over the um, attribute file existence. There are some problems. Some covert channels can be false positives. For instance, if two operations could be could build an RM pair but cannot be called by a process of different security levels, then of course it cannot be a covert channel cannot be exploited. So it actually is not really there um, because it will never be created. Um, the SRM supports no sequences of operations. But a sequence of n operations may lead to an indirect recognition of a modified attribute. So that's an interesting point. Maybe we need to call different attribute uh, operations in a row to infer information about some attribute. And this is not what we can directly recognize using the SRM. Uh, Camera states uh, in his book Computer Security in Art and Science that all storage and timing channels can be detected uh, sorry, Camera in his 1983 work, of course, that all storage and timing channels can be detected using the SRM however Bishop in his book Computer Security, Art and Science, it's a pretty famous book uh, states that this is wrong um, because of what I said earlier In the mid-90s, John McHalf um, improved the uh, SRM and therefore um, introduced three enhancements into the SRM, uh, which is called the extended SRM. And um, the first uh, enhancement is the introduction of user flows. That's a differentiation between input and output for operations through the user. A user, in that case, can always access the input of an operation but not necessarily the output. Um, that's specific to some programming languages like Gypsy that was used by McHuff, uh, where um, it's possible that um, the uh, feedback to the user would be prevented in case of a failure. Second enhancement is operation splitting. Um, so in the original SRM, there's no distinction between really independent flows within an operation. So actually, these flows would form different, um, could form different operations, um, and the matrix is for this reason further differentiated for each modifiable object, and uh, each modifiable object gets its separate column. So. Um, for instance, it could be the case that several attributes are used or references referenced in an operation, but only subsets are actually related with each other. And these subsets f um, follow fully independent flows. There is an excellent example on page 7 in reference 2 um, that shows that um, with a very short code fragment. And guard expansion is based on the operation splitting. So we already splitted the operations in independent flows. And, uh, but for them, we provide a distinction for different cases. Um, in the example in the paper that is shown, uh, so in paper number two, there is um, um, a variable that is assigned a value, but the value depends on another a variable. So some variable A might be set to B, but only if D is 1, and otherwise A might be set to C. Um, again, I refer you to page 7 um, of that paper. That makes it, uh, I think, very clear. Um, but I assume um, the explanation using this slide is already uh, making it rather clear. Um,
there is a drawback of the ESRM in comparison to the SRM and its increased complexity is that. Um, but there is at least one tool for the Gypsy language that automatically generates the ESRM. Next thing that I like to discuss is also an early 90s methodology called um, covert flow trees and they work on the code level uh, to detect covert channels in source code. Um, I won't cover every last aspect of covert flow trees but um, the core idea. Let's look at this code fragment here. We have two procedures. One is increased temperature, one is check temperature. So uh, let's assume the increased temperature calls some function called heat or procedure called heat uh, that uh, uses the current temperature which is set to some internal temperature value when passed to the function. Uh, whatever this does, it doesn't matter at the moment. The important thing is uh, it uses these variables and we increase the in internal temperature somehow by uh, uh, incrementing its value. Now the other procedure, check temperature, um, first checks whether the internal temperature is within uh, some or below some soft limit and if that's the case uh, then the internal temperature is returned. Otherwise some error code is returned. For instance if the temperature is unreasonably high, be, uh, higher than the soft limit, then this might be a failure, something like that. So, um, and we built such a metrics here. It's like the SRM, but slightly different. So we we have um, the methods or procedures that were called operations in the SRM, and we have them on top here: increase temperature and check temperature. And we uh, list the variables um, or attributes that we that they reference, modify, and return. So increase temperature references current temperature and internal temperature, while it modifies the internal temperature by incrementing it. Um, check temp also returns a, f um, um, a value, namely internal temperature. Now we take in the next step this matrix and form a covert flow tree. A covert flow tree always focuses on some attribute, in this case internal temperature. A covert flow tree is created for every attribute. And if the tree can be successfully created in its entirety, then um, a cover channel is considered present. So we need a logical end, and that logical end uh, means that both um, branches need to be fulfilled here. So we need to modify the attribute and we need to recognize the modification. We need to read the attribute. So the, the same story as always. And um, in the easiest case, we can somehow directly modify um, uh, the internal temperature using increased temperature because we have only one operation that modifies internal temperature and that is based on our matrix increased temperature. And we need to recognize the modifications. We need to read the internal temperature. And the easiest way, I mean, we can somehow infer this over the references maybe, but for, of course the easiest way would be to call check temperature because it directly returns the internal temperature unless there is some error. So that means there would be a covert channel feasible. Um, there's also the option to have an indirect recognition of the attribute internal temperature uh, over some other procedure, maybe that is not listed in the code, something like that and then return some value based on the value of internal temperature, things like that. Uh, that's also feasible, so this is a logical or here, only one of these um, conditions uh, 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 must be uh, valid. All right, and then um, in the next step, um, we generate so-called code flow tree or CTF lists. Um, there are always two lists and uh, they contain the sequences of operations that pre represent the potential COVID channel. Um, these uh, branches here might um, become longer with more attributes, uh, more operations being necessary to be called to, for instance, modify a value or recognize it. 
So a list one contains all the operations capable of modifying the attribute. In our case, it's just increased temperature. And list two contains operations capable of reading the attribute. In our case, it's check temperature. And I said, well, there's some other procedure that we don't see, and it's called some other procedure. And finally, we combine the this to, to, sh to determine the potential cover channels. And it's always the combination here. So increased temperature is called uh, followed by check temperature. And that would be one option for the cover channel. The other would be over the indirect recognition using some other method um, as shown here. So what can be said about covert flow trees? Well, they can be applied at the source code level. That's a drawback in comparison to the SRM because the SRM can be applied also to other parts of the software development lifecycle, uh, for instance, um, based on textual specifications. Nobody has published uh, work on timing channel detection so far, so CT uh, covert flow trees, covert flow trees, can only be applied to detect storage channels, unless the opposite is proven. Uh, the visual representation of flows and the automatic generation of the flow trees uh, is a nice um, feature, and also they support indirect information flows, which is also nice to have. The next aspect that I, or next method that I want to show you is not a method that aims on detecting the, the potential covert channels, but um, here we assume there is a covert channel feasible, it's a timing one, um, and we want to limit its channel capacity. So a timing covert channel is one that uses temporal aspects, temporal behavior modification, and um, um, so it modulates some temporal attributes to covertly send information. And this is also from 1991. By the way, back then they already had virtual machines. This is um, often um, forgotten and um, people believe virtual machines are a rather new thing, but in fact they are not. And back then they already had a, a security kernel um, that um, isolated um, um, virtual machines quite well uh, within the WAX operating system. Um, and the idea is we have two virtual machines, virtual machine A and B, and they send uh, requests um, and uh, to the system time, and they also receive on-time notifications about events, for instance, interrupts. And by measuring some low-level events, uh, they can transfer information over the shared kernel. Um, so they modulate the timing of, of, of events, and then they... Um, and also um, um, recognize these mod modulations. And the more precise the time measurement of virtual machine A and B, the higher the channel capacity is because the finer the, the distinction of the elapsed time and so you can make the, the covert uh, signaling more precise. Um, this is really not about detecting or preventing the channels, it's only about limiting them. And the approach is called Fuzzy Time, was published by WHO and the Symposium on Security and Privacy, one of the two um, most competitive security conferences um, that we have. And it works as follows. So um, there's a distinction between notification and event time or up and down ticks. The event time or down ticks is the time when an event actually occurs. For instance, an interrupt occurs uh, in the VEX security kernel. And however, the event could be passed directly to the virtual machine. So they could be not notified immediately, but they are not. So there's a short randomized delay. So you, you s the, the, the matching um, notification time always corresponds with the with the index here. So the notification time one would re refer to event time one. Here, as you can see, the delta time delta is small, and for E two it's rather large, and for E three it's uh, a, 
on the other hand very small and you can um, differentiate this for every virtual machine and you can still implement such a method for today's virtual machines and you can of course also configure this randomized delay so you can control the remaining channel capacity um, remember this worked already in the early 90s I think they did this also to have the possibility to um, get the certification for high uh, security environments for the operating system or so um, this was a big research topic back then and the larger the delay the lower the channel capacity of course Now another um, limitation approach, and that's the spurious processes approach by Fatlala. I think basically nobody cites this work. Uh, I, I read his PhD thesis when I was a PhD student myself, and uh, I think I'm more or less the only one who cited this, at least um, for the first five years um, after my PhD, and his thesis was already published in the 90s. But his idea is not bad, actually. This is why I integrated it in this class. So, um, uh, actually, this approach was designed for databases. However, um, I prefer to explain this approach using file system, uh, utilizing covert storage channels. And the basic idea is to introduce a so-called spurious process, in short SP, um, into all potentially covert uh, communications without knowing in advance whether there is a covert communication or not. So it's not about detecting it. You are maybe, the, 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 the countermeasure is not aware of the presence in any way uh, of the covert channel. Um, so the spurious process is uh, introduced into the com potential covert communication between two regular op processes of the operating system and limits the channel capacity. And the spurious process is introduced on context switches by the operating system kernel if a shared object is accessed by two process processes without previous access to the um, uh, of the spurious process to the same object. And the thing here is that the spurious, pro spurious process has the same permissions uh, as P2 always. Um, this is um, a countermeasure that has the big drawback of introducing potential uh, failures because it performs operations, undesired operations on shared resources. So software must be written very well to uh, um, to remain stable under such a condition. Um, an example could be that we have two processes in a multi-level security system with a Bella Padula a security policy and we have unique file names so a file name cannot be uh, created multiple times and that P1 and P2 share the same file system and can uh, potentially read each other's or check the file existence at least. So here's the example on the side. On the left side, uh, we see processes, process 1's behavior, so it can either create the file or not. And P2, the receiver, checks whether the file exists by calling create. Uh, at just again, so SP, uh, sorry, the, the P1 calls create on the file name and P2 again. So if the file does not exist because P1 did not create it, then P1's create call would be successful Why it would be unsuccessful if the file already exists because the file cannot be created with the same name again in the same location. Now, the cover channel would be feasible, of course, without any problems. However, the spurious process is introduced here to um, limit the channel capacity as mentioned and what it does is it does the same as P2 would do with the same um, um, permissions as P2 and it would only do so if as mentioned here on the side the shared object in this case the file 
is accessed by two process without previous access of the spurious process to the same object. So um, because P2 also accesses the file, the same file again, the operation that P2 wants to perform is first performed by the spurious process and that either does create the file or tries to create it or it calls create and remove. Now, um, in result, if, P, if the spurious process would create or create and remove the file and P1 would have created the file, the file would exist in both cases. But if it would try to remove the file, it would not work file would still exist because the spurious process is a low-level process like P2 so it cannot remove the file. So in this case the file exists in any case. P2 is unsure whether it was created by P1 or SP but the file cre is um, existent uh, so that's that's fine. However, um, I mean in the first scenario it would be sure that it was originally created by P1. However, if P1 did not create the file but access the file somehow in advance and now p2 wants to access the file and calls create the spurious process would still call create and the file would exist but not because p1 created it so this is why p2 is unsure whether the file was created by p1 or by the spurious process if p1 did not create the file and the spurious process would create and remove the file the file would not exist in that case uh, P1 would receive the other bit, in that case the zero bit, and would be sure that none of these uh, would have, uh, that P2, uh, P1 would not have created the file, because otherwise uh, the spurious process wouldn't be able to remove it. So this does not eliminate the covert channel, of course. It just limits the um, uh, communication a bit. And um, there are other channels feasible, of course, uh, also timing based, but it becomes a little bit harder here and um, the covert channel peers must of course also be aware of the spurious process to uh, have a um, um, somehow successful communication. Alright, so that's it for the fundamental countermeasures and also for the introduction on non-network specific aspects of this class and also with the um, partially overlapping part with the other uh, part of this module. Next chapter will focus on network steganography uh, methods and uh, also the following chapters will deal with network steganography.